Okay, so we're going to first start with inverse functions. Um, now, if you remember, inverse functions are where basically you switch the domain and the range to your x and the y values. So where an inverse function maps the elements of the domain to the range. Now, I don't know if you know this, but not all functions have an inverse that is a function. Let me say again. Not all functions have an inverse that is a function. And in order to find out whether a function's inverse is a function, you do the horizontal line test. What do you guys used to do at the vertical line test? Vertical line test assesses what? To tell if that is a function. So the same thing applies with the horizontal line test. So basically horizontal line test is like if you have a parabola quadratic and if I draw a horizontal line, if the horizontal line crosses that graph in more than one spot, that means that its inverse is not a function. So the horizontal line test assess whether the inverse is a function or not. Now we say, like in the cubic, where the horizontal line test only crosses once, we say that then it is a one-to-one -one function. That's what that vocabulary means, is that the inverse is, exists and it is a function. So the cubic is a one-to-one -one function. However, the quadratic equation is not a one-to-one. -one because its inverse is not a function. Have you guys been introduced to the one-to-one -one vocabulary before? Some of you from here? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, now, in finding an inverse function, we can find the inverse two different ways. Okay? Well, actually, we can do all of these methods, graphically, numerically, algebraically. So we're going to check out the graphical method of finding an inverse. So basically, in order to find graph the inverse function, you're going to take its um, table of values, and you're going to reverse the table of values. So what was the input and the output, now will just be reversed, and it'll be, the output will be the input, input will become the output. So let's do an example. So let's say we have x cubed minus 1. Now to make it a little simpler, I just already made the x, y value. Um, the minus 1, how will that affect the parent function? That one, right, exactly. We know our cubic normally is at 0, 0. So now the y-intercept will be at 0, negative 1. And if we were to graph this function, it would look something like this. Okay. So this is f of x. Now to graphically examine the inverse function. So for the inverse then, I would just reverse the coordinates. So instead of being 0, negative 1, we're going to have negative 1, 0. Instead of 1, 0, the 0, 1. Negative 2, negative 1. And 7, 2. And negative 9, negative 2. Okay? So go ahead and sketch x cubed minus 1, and let's sketch the inverse and see how they compare graphically. So negative 1, 0. 0, 1. Negative 2, negative 1. Just quick review, even functions are symmetric about what? Y-axis, good. Odd functions are symmetric about what? Origin, Origin. good. Odd, O, O. And so then inverse functions are symmetric about what? Y equals X, good. So if we were to draw Y equals X here, we would see that yes, these two are symmetric about the Y equals X line. If I folded it along that line, the two of them would then overlap. Okay. So that is a graphical perspective of finding a function's inverse. Okay. And we can see that the inverse, which is in blue, if I tried the vertical line test on the inverse, it passes. So the inverse of the function is also a function. It has one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay. Now we're going to talk about algebraically. How do you find an inverse of a function? So that's the graphical approach. And remember, again, I'll put this whole lesson, the video, on campus. Okay? 
So to find the function algebraically, now we're going to do the, basically the exact same thing, but we're going to switch the x and the y coord, x and y values. So this is y equals x cubed minus 1. So to find its inverse, we have x equals y cubed minus 1. Okay. Now what do I do with this function? You guys remember? Solve for y, exactly. So we'll add 1. And then we'll take the third root of both sides. So we get the third root of x plus 1 is equal to y, which is the inverse of x. Okay? So that is the algebraic approach to finding an inverse. Now, there's something special and unique about inverses, and that is that, um, oh, first of all, let me just write a couple of um, terms, and I've been using this. So, you'll notice in the, um, an inverse function is notated as f, and it looks like it's raised to the negative 1, but it's not actually raised to the negative 1. It's just a way of notating inverse. So, do not think that f raised to the negative 1 is 1 over f of x. It just is the inverse of x, okay? So that's don't think of it as an exponent. But do you guys remember that when you take the composite of a function and its inverse, it is equal to the composite of the inverse of the function if you truly have found uh, the inverse function, if it's correct. This is a way of checking to see if you have found the inverse function. So in other words, if I go f of f negative 1, I will get a value that's equivalent to the inverse of f of x. So we're going to try that and see if, and verify that those two are inverse functions. Okay. So f of f inverse. So I take the f function and wherever there's an x value, I'm going to replace it with the inverse of x. Now this is good practice because you're going to have a problem in your quiz where you're going to do some composites. So we're kind of reviewing a little bit here. So wherever the x value is, I'm going to replace it with the cubed root of x plus 1. And what happens when you simplify that quantity there? What do you get? Right in here, what happens? x plus 1, right? So the third power reduced simplifies with the third root. So we end up with x plus 1 minus 1. So the result is x. Now, if I have found the correct inverse, when I do the same process here, I should get x also. Okay, that'll prove that it's correct. So I take the f inverse function, and wherever there's an x, I'm going to replace it with the f function. Now, I tend to do this just to help myself not make mistakes when I do composites. I write the function and leave the variable so parenthetical. So now I'm going to substitute x cubed minus 1 into the f inverse function, and I end up with x cubed because negative 1 and plus 1, so we have x again. So we have just proved, proven, that we have the correct inverse function of x cubed minus 1. Now, if it didn't come out equal, then I made a mistake, either in my proof or I made a mistake in finding the inverse function. So something's not working. Okay. So... The, um, I'm not going to do that example, it's a little cuckoo crazy, but in a nutshell then, this is how you'll see it theoretically written. A function f of x has an inverse, f is inverse x, if and only if the composites of the two is equal to x. Now you must do both composites to prove it. It's not good enough just to do like one part, you will not be given credit like on an exam, if it says prove the inverses, you have to do both composites as part of your proof. Okay? You must do both. Okay. Last part, and then we'll switch to practicing a little bit. Logarithmic functions. Okay? So, now, logarithms, of course, the reason why logarithms are showing up right now is we've just reviewed the concept of inverse. So, logarithms are the inverse of exponential, right? So before we graph a logarithm function, let's graph 2 to the x. And so I just have a nice order pair. 
So we have 0, 1, 1, 2. So you can graph your inverse function. Get it going there. 3, 8. Okay. So this is f of x equals 2 to the root. So now we want to graph its inverse. Graphically, how would you do that? Flip them, right. So instead of 0, 1, now we're going to have 1, 0. We're going to have 2, 1. We're going to have 4, 2, 8, 3, okay? And it looks something like this. So this is the graph of the logarithm base 2x, okay? But you can see, though, how can you justify that those graphs are, um, right, the sim they, do they have symmetry at y equals x? Looks like it doesn't. Okay. Yes, Colby. Uh, what if the x is like this is down in the leaves and then the x is like down here? Um, let's check it. So let's take this graph. Let's see if I can move this well. Let's shift it down one. So then therefore this one shifts down one. Wait, we're doing that correctly. Shift down one. So then... Yes, because it can't be symmetric to y equals x then, right? Yeah. Whoops. So then the si line of symmetry then. Yes, exactly. Good. Good question. Very good. Okay. Got it. Okay. Now, last of all, you don't have to copy all these down. Okay? Because they're small font. But I'm just letting you know, on page 41, they have the properties of logarithms. Now, we've already used these properties a couple times in solving exponential functions. Like, we've used the power property, right? We've used this idea that if you have, um, oh, now if I can remember it, um, like this team, the x, and if we take the logarithm of both sides, right, we know that by properties we get log of y equals x times log of 15. That's an example of one of the properties of logarithms. And most of these you do naturally, but some of them you might need to revisit. So it is on page 41 if you get stuck with them, one of them. Okay. And we'll review these in our practice that we're going to do in a minute. Mm -hmm. If there's a, like, if you want to draw and solve this and do x over 4, you can use x over 4. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, let's practice now. So now you can do this. I know a lot, some of you have different. Let me go ahead and turn my, let me stop the video. Oh, I did this much faster this time. 